So let's see. Does it work? So can you see it? Uh, just a question. I also seeing my cursor. Just to understand whether you okay. Yeah. So I'm going to to present the the work that I've done in the in the last years on verification of distributed algorithms um, to to give you some some. Uh, context. So the question, of course, is why distributed systems might not be dependable. And uh, there are, of course, two, uh, two primary sources. One is faults that are uh, happening at, on, uh, at runtime, which are typically outside of the, of the control of designers and developers, like power outage or hardware faults. So this example here is uh, actually one of my, of my favorite examples. It's a uh, uh, a, a diode from the network controller of the space shuttle, which had a crack here, and therefore it wasn't actually a diode, but some capacity and created weird signals on the on the network. And actually, on the test bed, led to a partitioning of the group. So this sort of really was a pisson pin behavior because different processes received different messages. So this, uh, the, the game is the first photo of a pisson pin fault. And then there are, of course, uh, also faults that happen at, uh, at uh, uh, design and implementation, uh, typically programming faults, uh, design, design faults. And the way we deal with the faults that happen around time is typically redundancy. So we do fault tolerant distributed algorithms. And uh, the faults we one approach to deal, uh, to, to deal with the faults that happen at design implementation faults is computer verification. So the idea is to find these faults, these bugs uh, before uh, and, and fix them. And of course, the interesting point is that the moment you do fault tolerance, fault tolerance distributed algorithms, the system becomes more complicated. So you are more likely actually to have design implementation uh, problems. And therefore the idea is the question is how can computer added verification add uh, with uh, don't having uh, bugs in the full torrent mechanism. And that's what we are working on. So, and when we started this kind of work, so the, 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 the where model checking had been used for fault tolerance was in, in typically in safety critical systems. So they started to use it in, in fault tolerant uh, control systems in, 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 in cars. Um, they yeah, know that they, they worked on that and tried to find bugs in their protocols, but typically they have designs with uh, three processes, four processes. So in there, uh, more or less guessing model checking uh, can, 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 can deal with them. But the question that we posed ourselves was, okay, if I look at you know, bigger systems with uh, hundreds or thousands processes, can we also do this? And when you do it just with the same methods that you would use for the small systems of three to seven processes, it just wouldn't scale. You know, the verifiers would run out of memory or out of time. And of course, while uh, the area is called verification, so the interesting thing is actually we are behind bugs. We want to find bugs. So the verification uh, is like the, the goal, but what actually you are behind is you want to find bugs. In so from a, from a high level viewpoint, what automation verifi automated verification uh, is doing is, so you have a system description, so either in a programming language or in some uh, hardware description language or in a specific, specific languages for, for verification tools. And you compile them into a mathematical model, a grid structure, it's basically just a graph. And you have informal specifications, like you, know, uh, you don't want to run in the deadlock or you don't want to have, you know, uh, eventually some, you want to generate some output. And these specifications, you transfer them into temporal logic properties that are, that are describing the system behavior. And then you have a verification tool that uh, gives you an answer. It tells you, yes, this model here actually satisfies the temporal logic property or no. And then the interesting thing is that these verifiers typically give you, or the goal is that they give you counterexamples. So they give you error traces that you can then use to understand where your system uh, went wrong and, 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 and fix the bug. So this is the, 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 the great advantage of these tools. But of course, the more uh, complex the verification task is, more often you also you know, run out of time and, and, and out of memory, and then you have to you know, scratch your head and think how you can uh, help the verifier or adapt the verifier to deal with the problems that you're having. So that's the, the, the big, uh, the big you know, picture of, of automated verification. 
Um, so the verification problem that we looked at uh, is the parameterized verification problem of parameterized model checking. So the point is basically you look at the family of systems, they are uh, described by a protocol and you want to verify them you know, for three processes, for four processes, for 10 processes. So you don't want to a priori fix the, fix the size and check them against the temporal logic property. The point is that you don't want to fix them, is that you are going to, but in this way, if you find a method that can verify this, this, this family of systems, you verify big systems. So this parameterized model checking is a paradigmatic approach to, to uh, address the problem of scale in, in, in terms of the number of participants. Um, and the algorithms we started to look at were sort of classic textbook fault tolerant uh, distributed algorithms uh, like, like that one here. This is a part of a broadcasting algorithm. So here in, in this variable, you store whether you have received the message from the broadcaster or not. And then here you have to, you in, a, in, a, in a loop, you execute this code repeatedly and with the goal that either everyone is accepting this message. So every process here at some point is going to to, to take this message or, or no one, so that you agree on the fact that this message was sent or not. And the problematic uh, things that you, that you have in this kind of algorithms are that you have these expressions here, uh, which are parametric expressions that are very, that you use in, in these protocols. And I guess, and you know this, this kind of expressions also from the, from the Tendermint protocol. So classic expressions here is like t plus one. So if you wait for a message, and t is the number of faults. So if you receive messages from t plus one processes, you know that at least one correct guy has sent a message, for example. And then this relation between these two parametric expressions here and some assumption the number of faults. So here, for example, classic assumption, you have n processes and t is the number of faults. So you have n greater than 3t processes. And here f is the, uh, actually num process number of faults that happen during a run, we have this accuracy in this modeling for several uh, purposes because it allows us the more fine-grained analysis. But the point is, when we started our work, there was no method that, that, that could deal with this kind of uh, expressions and with these kinds of resilience conditions. And this what is, for fault tolerance experience is so the crucial thing, and therefore we started to look into this, into this uh, verification of these algorithms. So, and since I talked about the, the formalization of, of uh, specifications, so typically, uh, at least in the literature on distributed algorithms, you find English phrases like this. So if, you know, all, process, all correct processes have initially this variable set to zero, then for all correct processes, except should always remain zero. So if no one wants to accept a message, then no one will ever accept the message. And this can be expressed in, uh, in temporal logic, in particular in linear temporal logic, which just says something like, okay, it's a conjunction of all processes. We only, yeah. I don't give you all the detail here, but if everyone initially has the value zero, then it should always hold globally that accepts this zero at all processes. And this here is a lifeness property. So if initially everyone uh, has a one, then you want at some point that, uh, that uh, one process accepts and what they also want if at some point one process accepts then eventually everyone accepts these are typically typical uh, um, specifications of uh, of uh, agreement like agreement like properties of distributed algorithms and the verification problem that we are interested in is this one so you have a system composed of n processes, uh, at most t can be faulty if are actually faulty in a run, and you want to prove that for all runs that satisfy it, that n is greater than 3t, and you, know, you don't have more faults than you, than you expect, then a parallel composition of n minus f correct processes, and these processes are parameterized because we have seen that in the guards n and t appear, so a parallel composition of this correct process and of the faulty process satisfies all the specifications. So this is a parameterized verification problem because we have here this, uh, we want something for all, for all number of processes. And when we are able to verify a system under these conditions, it will also hold for n is greater, say is equal to 1000 or whatever, every finite number. Um, so, and theoretically, for, so if 
you know, if I, I'm allowed to write arbitrary specifications here, uh, these things are uh, undecidable, which means you cannot solve the problem if you allow all kinds of algorithms and all kinds of specifications. So of course we limit ourselves to, you know, basic distributed algorithms that have certain guards and uh, the specifications here, uh, we're not allowed to, to write uh, specifications that sort of are artificial, that run into unsuitability. What we found is that specifications that we would like to write are actually also the ones that we can, that we can handle. So, but this is some, this takes a lot of, you know, uh, work to figure out the right logic in purpose. So, of course, the first question that we started with was uh, how to actually make a formal model of this. Because so we didn't start from uh, implementations like 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 you have in, in, in Tendermint, the running code. But we used we started to look at the protocols that come from the literature, and these this are basically in English. So there's some pseudo code, but there's no semantics of that, and a lot of the assumptions about you know message exchange, how long it takes to take steps, everything is is rather informal. So there is sort of a landscape of of uh, of uh, you know languages. So there are famous ones by by, by, by Lambert, uh, this TLA plus, and the IO automata by, by Nancy Lynch. They are very general frameworks. We can write a lot of uh, uh, algorithms and, and, and systems, but because they are so expressive, uh, it's, it's really hard to, to do something in a fully automated way. On the other hand, you have implementations that are you know, also very, very detailed uh, compared to the pseudo code. There are, of course, much more detail that you have to add you know, for memory management, buffering the messages, and things like this. There are domain specific languages, for example, this here is but uh, it's distal, the Shaco knows about this very well, where you have some specific constructs uh, that allow you to express, for example, waiting for T plus one messages. And this already is a, is a sort of a good starting point because it gives you, um, uh, these languages are designed with something in mind. People wanted to express algorithms, so they restrict sort of, you know, waiting conditions in a, in a specific way, and this can, can be a, so the question for us was how do we do we model these 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 kind of algorithms? So the first uh, formalization we came up was uh, this control flow automata, where basically uh, one path. So this models one iteration in this loop of the pseudocode that we have seen before. So in the, we are modeling. Uh, with the shared variables, so the number of sent messages is a shared variable, and you have a local variable, this number of received messages. So in the beginning of the iteration of, of the pseudocode loop, what happens is you set the number of received value to somewhere between the old value of received and uh, the number of messages sent plus f. And the point here is, here we capture that you have uh, fp something false, and you could receive messages from them, but you don't have to. So here you capture a lot of the non deterministic that you have in the system due to asynchrony and the messages and message path and things like this. And then the branching inside the loop uh, is done with the, with the classical uh, control flow graph. So if you have initially the value one, for example, this modeled in this uh, in this status variable, then you're going to increment the end send, which means you send. Uh, a message and you change your, your status variable to SE, which means send echo. And you have here these guards that express, okay, I've received uh, more than T plus one messages, or I've received more than N minus T messages. And then depending on these, you're going to update, for example, here, uh, you're going to um, accept. So this is a, is a formalization. This is not English. This we can also you know, transform into a logical formula, or as we did here, we encoded it into Promela, which is a, a special purpose uh, language to describe protocols uh, for the speed model checker. And then what we did as a first step, we did classic finite state model checking. So we fixed the number of processes here from three to eight or to nine. Uh, played with the number of faults and just did, did, did uh, model checking. And what happened is that we actually verified as expected for this number of processes the, the algorithm. And when you played a little bit with the, with the parameters, for example, if you say, okay, I have uh, n is equal to 3t, so I have three processes, one of them can be Byzantine, we are tool immediately uh, generated counterexamples. Uh, 
So wow. keep for the. Did you try? Um, <clears throat> did you try also, uh, like maybe changing something in the protocol and keep and seeing if it like could it generate a cor uh, counter example for if the protocol was broken? Oh, oh yes, definitely. I mean, if we change like the the, the threshold guard, for example, um, right, uh, it's immediately uh, uh, finds 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 counter examples. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Um, so that was the, 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 the sort of the, the starting point. Um, the question, of course, is how to verify these things in the, in the, in the parameterized setting. So in there, we have we came, came up with several techniques. The first one that we played is, or that we used was abstraction. So we had in this control flow automata these variables on the received messages. So instead of having these variables uh, as integers, as real numbers, we uh, uh, computed over intervals. So we said, look, the algorithm doesn't care whether you receive uh, one or T messages. What is interesting, did you receive T or did you receive T plus one? Because this makes a difference in whether you are, whether a guard is true or false. So it's an abstraction that works with parametric intervals. Um, this was the first thing we did. And the second, second thing we did, which we explored, is that these algorithms don't really use the, the you know, IDs. You just do counting, basically. At the, sort of, if you look at the high level, you just count how many messages you receive. And when we make this, uh, these two techniques to work, what we get is we get verification results in the parameterized case, both for safety and lightness. So what's interesting here, this uh, red um, uh, line here uh, indicates the time and here the memory that you need to check it in the parameterized case. And what you see, this corresponds roughly to the verification of seven processes. So you can verify uh, these kind of algorithms um, for any number of processes with this abstraction uh, method uh, in the same time that you would do in the explicit state model checking with seven processes. So, so what was the what was the second technique? So the first one is instead of just counting the um, the second one is basically sorry the first one is you abstract over ranges. Yeah. Um, so you don't care if it's two or three, you just care is it is it t or t plus one. Yeah. And what is the second one here? So the second one is that you use symmetry. So for example, you have three different states. So this is one uh, global state. You have one process in the red state, and these two processes are uh, in a blue state. And this sort of this state is different, right? Because the first process here is blue and the second one is red. I see. And what you're doing is you just say they're the same. I just count they're all the same. I see. The same. I see. And then on top of this, you apply abstraction again. So instead of counting how many processes are in this state over integers, you count again over the same uh, intervals. Yeah. Okay. And then so, what you have is, you know, the processes, the, the local counters are over a finite state because you only have intervals rather than integers. And the counters are also over a finite range because you always want to do this thing over, over parametric intervals. So you end up in a finite description of the, of the model. Um, and, uh, and, and you can do verification. There are some things which complicated things which we got rid of later. So one of the things, for example, is, is, is um, that because you have abstraction, you, have, you could, uh, if you add one to the number of received messages, for example, in the concrete system, you always get a bigger value, right? Because if you increment the integer, it always gets bigger. But if you make an increment here, this is sketched sort of here, you stay either in the same interval or you go to the next interval. Mm -hmm. And this creates some, uh, behavior that you infinitely often could increment a variable without jumping the interval. Yeah. This creates what we call spurious counterexamples. So there are counterexample traces in the abstract that don't correspond to a counterexample in the concrete. And, but this also we, we analyzed, uh, our tool analyzes them automatically, uh, does refinement and we can get rid of that. But so, so how does this interval, how do you move between intervals if you're, uh, like if you're adding one and it's leaving you in the same state how does it know when you actually have accumulated enough to go to the next state? So the, the point is that uh, in, in, in principle, um, you, during the verification, uh, you don't. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you, uh, you are going to uh, uh, impose fairness constraints. So you're going to figure out that you cannot, you know, you cannot stay in an infinite loop 
uh, yeah. you, 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 you analyze it and you say, okay, there is no concrete system that allows you this behavior. And then you say, okay, if you, if you are in a loop, you have to, to leave the loop uh, eventually. And then you add this constraint to the abstract system uh, to do the best prediction. Okay. So, but as I said, this, luckily we, we got rid of with the, with the method I'm going to, to describe next. Uh, and this one, uh, the, the main point that we use there is reduction. So this basically is exploiting the partial orders you have in, in distributed computations. So for example, if you have here uh, two message types, for example, uh, and you have two variables, n sent one and n sent two, so there's this one trace where you increment in this order, or there's the black trace where you increment in the other order. And you could say, I can, you know, to generate a count example, there might be one which I like better, and I only look into this one because the two are equivalent in, in, in some case in some sense. In yeah, particular, the ones we're interested in is when we can, can use reordering in order to um, bring uh, transitions, uh, the same transitions together. So for example, if three processes, one, two, three, the, all three send the same message, we can bring them together and, then one, and say, okay, it's not three transitions, but one transitions. So since, since think about, um, for example, in, in Tendermint, you know, the proposer sends out the, the, the messages to everyone, and then everyone has to react and, and send a message back. So this could be arbitrary interleave, but because of reductions, what you can do is you say, I take an execution, I, the reduction brings all the same you know, response events together, and then I say, instead of you know, having five response events, or you know, I just have one, where this is sort of accelerated into one transition. And for this, we have a slightly different uh, uh, formalization. This is what we call threshold automata. I will explain you by an example. So for example, this is a non-blocking atomic commit algorithm. So processes can either be initially in a yes state or in a no state, depending on this, they send no or they send yes. Then they are in this send state here. And then they have, again, this kind of threshold guard. So if they have received uh, n yes answers, they go to uh, yes pro propositions, they go to pro commit. If they received at least one no, they go into a board. And this uh, Renal and Garay, these authors, they implemented this thing. Uh, so what also can happen is that processes crash. So from every point, you can go in a crash state and to sort of solve this problem, they use something which is called failure detectors. So if a process suspects someone to have crashed, then it goes to the support state or it can go back to unsuspect. So this is the, the the modeling. So what you see here is we do not have received variables anymore. All these variables are shared, and we just uh, act on the on the on the shared variables. So this is some sort of a uh, even more uh, abstract way to describe these algorithms. But this works really nicely. And then you have specifications, safety and lightning specifications. For example, if a process has uh, if a process goes here, has proposed commit, then you want to ensure that everyone actually voted yes. These are the kind of properties you're yeah, interested in. And then we use these kind of techniques again, counting, acceleration, acceleration and bounded model checking. And I give you some, some, some high level view. And even there's, you know, to make this work very efficiently, there's more, but I don't want to keep it, uh, go into too much detail here in the, regarding the internals. So again, we, since we have symmetry, we count processes. So example, we have here one process, uh, four processes in the yes state, one process in the send state. Uh, and this guy is actually sent a no, this is like recorded here. And then if a process wants to go from a yes to the send state, you have this transition, which you express just as decrementing yes, incrementing send, and incremented the shared variable send. So this is how you express one transition. Uh, now again, you have this idea of acceleration. So if you have four processes to do the same thing, uh, one after the other, you can do it in one uh, accelerated transitions where you have here these this, this values. And this acceleration, this value here, we call it acceler acceleration factor, and this can be any natural number, okay? And then when you have this, you can express a transition as a logical formula in linear integer arithmetic. So a transition from sigma to sigma i plus one, 
as, as depicted here is you decrease yes by delta, increase sent by delta, and uh, in, uh, increase yes by delta. And this is a, just a conjunction. So you have a constraint. This relates the values of the counters before and after the transition. Now, if I have an execution like this, I can just write one big logical formula that relates all these, uh, these transition, these counters uh, to each other. And then I can add a specification. For example, spe but this actually is the negation of the specification. For example, it tells me, okay, there was one process who wanted to say uh, no, but at the end, uh, someone went to propose commit. And then you ask the, and then you give this formula to the solver and ask the solver, are there evaluations of all these variables that satisfy this formula? And now if the solver says yes, what you get, you get a precise description of the counter example traits. You have all the counters and all the transitions that lead uh, to a bad state, and then you can take it and analyze it. Or if the, if the solver tells you uh, no, then you know that this execution uh, uh, does not lead to a counter example. So this is what is called bounded model checking. But this you can only do if you know the length of the execution. So what you can do is you can do this for bounded executions, but that's not what you want. You know, what you want to have is you want to verify a specification for all executions independently how long they are. And the question is, is there some relation? And this was the work that we, that we did and to prove actually that there is a if and only if. So if I can just uh, analyze certain bounded executions, I'm going to get results for um, all executions. So you can verify the system by verifying bounded execution. So I think I have to go a little bit uh, quicker here. So these are the kind of algorithms that we verified from the literature with different, different uh, threshold expressions. They are, they are all asynchronous algorithms. Some of them for crash faults, some of them for Byzantine faults. Um, and um, so this is sort of the, an overview of the progress that we, that we have made. So the first technique with, this, uh, uh, with the abstractions and the intervals I talked about was sort of this here, where we could you know, verify these two, two benchmarks or so. And then uh, you know, we get, these were some intermediate results. And so this final technique that we are using, we verify this. Number. So what are what are these what is uh, what is a check benchmark like what are we seeing on the x-axis? So these are basically here there are, I don't know what there are six six or six different algorithms. Mm -hmm. but then you have different um, different uh, oh, sometimes different cases about the resilience conditions and different safety properties. So these are basically the number of uh, specifications checked for the algorithms. I see. Across all the algorithms. Across all the algorithms, yeah. yeah. Are, they, are they somehow ordered or it's just kind of random? No, it's kind of random. I think it's just, okay. yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's the uh, memory here. Hmm. And so this was about uh, uh, reachability, so about safety of algorithms, which is sort of, you know, you never reach a bad state, which is nice because every count example is a finite path. So you start with finite path and you just have to show that you know, shorten them uh, in some way. In Leibniz, everything becomes a little bit more complicated because a count example to Leibniz is an infinite path. And so you, do, you have to, uh, sort of have to argue that the shortening is not so, not so easy if you talk about safety and Leibniz. And you cannot just talk about bad states, you actually have to talk about temporal, temporal formulas. So there is where it uh, became a, a little crispy more, but uh, also this we could, we could address. So basically what we have shown uh, then uh, later is, so if you have a, a count example, the first point you have to show that, okay, it's an infinite trace, but every infinite trace only visits uh, uh, a finite number of different states. This implies that you are at some point you end up in a, in a loop, okay? So a count example is a trace that ends up in a loop. And then we say, okay, if we, if there is a arbitrary long, uh, this is we call a lasso, it's a lasso shape, right? Because you have the loop at the end. And what we say is if there's a lasso counter example, then there's also a short bounded counter example. And this is enough to, to verify safety and lightness of, of these, these algorithms. So that's what we, that's what we did. So we can verify these two algorithms that are asynchronous and parameterized. We can have 
different kind of, of fault models. We also have combination of fault models where we have Byzantine faults and crash faults in the same uh, in the same algorithm. Basically, what we do in this work, we in, so the same to all because we have the symmetry which which we need, need and we have this this threshold cut. Sorry, I, I don't know if I missed this, but how are we how are you capturing uh, the prospect of a Byzantine fault? Okay, so um, so I didn't mention it, I guess, in this part. For example, here, what you would do is you would add again a parameter. You would say one plus f, for example. So you you say, okay, I can receive additionally f messages from faulty guys, and these are part of the of the threshold expressions. But how do you know that the <clears throat> like how do you know that f is the like that your threshold guard is correct against uh, you know Byzantine failure? Like how do you know that the the you know like it, it seems like this is kind of um, there's it's like some some assumption is dropping from heaven about oh if I add f's over here this will make this algorithm tolerant to Byzantine failures and then I just gotta model check it with the f. But oh, how do you know so, that? Um, okay, so it's okay. Um... I don't know if you wait, give me a second. So I, I show you on the, on, the, on the other thing here. So here, uh -huh. the, the guards are over the T. So T is the known parameter that you have in the, in the, in the code of the algorithm. It's a number of, of and, and N and T you know, and this can appear in the, in the expressions here. But here, in the, basically in the reception, you model that you have uh, the impact of faulty processes. Because the T at the end, you will have to, it must appear in the code, right? You have to fix, like, in the classic sense, you say, okay, I, I now deploy an algorithm. I say it's tolerant to two faults. So I'm going to have here an expression which says three, and this is part of the code. While up here, we model actually the environment. So here we say, okay, you can have up to F uh, additional messages. Hmm. But we still don't know. Like we're, so, we don't explicitly have something that allows like um, like arbitrary behavior within the within the protocol. We're just trying to we're kind of like trying to capture it up front in the environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's what you what you also could do is you could also explicitly model a Byzantine fault as uh, also in an automaton like this. And it basically can send a message or not send a message. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end, it will just, the, the, the impact they have on the, on the, the correct guys will, will, will be the same. And you have to carry them in the verification explicitly. Right. But here, this sort of is more, um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a leaner way to, to, to model them because yeah. you just uh, capture the influence they have on, on, on correct processes. Fair enough. But uh, I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, a choice. I mean, crash faults, for example, typically we, we, we capture with, with um, uh, you know, crash states and there we keep, keep all the processes uh, explicit in the system. Also, because often in crash systems, the specifications you want to talk about the internals of crash processes. Right. In the Byzantine case, typically specifications do not talk about the processes because they don't do any assumptions. In right. But so, I mean, what if you wanted to actually um, type the different faults? So you have crash faults, and then you and then you might have um, maybe different kinds of Byzantine faults, and maybe you want to maybe you want to build an algorithm that has you know different thresholds for the different types, like. You can tolerate them not sending, and you can tolerate them sending garbage, but maybe not some other thing. Um, you have to. You have to. You. Uh, you have to. I mean, this is a graph. You have to to, to model them, and those, right. you have to understand how to formalize um, the the assumptions uh, on the um, uh, on, you know on the faults. So that's. Okay. I mean, the, the point here is also, I mean, it's, uh, it's, of course, I don't give you all the details here, but for example, what you, if you want to verify a, a liveness property, yeah. what you will have to say that this received value here uh, eventually is going to reach the, the end send, right? It's an assumption on reliable communication that actually the received will get all the messages sent. 
-hmm. This also has to go into the model. So we put this into the, into the specification of the problem, for example. While you know, the Fs here, you're not guaranteed to, to, to receive, right? So there's this non determinism that you, know, that, that, that you have to deal with. But yeah, so right now what we do is we, we, we model this fold uh, explicitly. So we have a, you know, we, we understand how to, to, to get the specifications. What are, are the, the, the formalizations? What would be interesting is to say, look, I give you, I have a, an automaton or whatever of the correct process and I give you the fault model and somehow I want now automatically generating the, the faulty semantics of the, of the system. Right. So we thought about this and we have, I mean, one of my students did, did this in, in, in TLA, but it's not necessarily the most efficient way to, to then when it's go to verification. Okay, but, cool. Yeah. So this is what we can do. I would like to spend some time to talk about uh, what, is what is missing to verify uh, implement implementations of systems and you know, blockchains and tendermint. So. so the first point, of course, is that what I talked uh, about here was protocol verification. So it was a you know, high level protocol descriptions without all the details uh, of running code. So of course, if you want to verify the implementations, you will have to, you know, talk about the code and there are two parts in my opinion. So one is actually checking the, the sequential code. So there are, you know, classic things that one would, you know, be interested in, like, you know, checking that insertions never is, uh, or assertions are always old or uh, that they don't have uh, infinite loops and things like this. And these are more or less classic verification methods uh, for sequential code. So, but the point would need to be done is to formalize what we expect of the code and then see whether we can do something with the existing method. The other thing is formalize whether the code implements the, the high level distributed algorithm. So there is sort of, you have some, some uh, this is also related to the you know, fault assumptions and lightness assumptions that I talked uh, before, right? You have to ensure, for example, that you know, the messages actually reach the, the algorithm and that you don't have, um, that some of the implementation doesn't match the assumption that you used for the, for the high level uh, description. So, but I think this, all these kind of questions, what we need to do is to sit down, uh, understand uh, how to formalize them and try to see which uh, existing uh, method, uh, verification tool they can use. And there are several, you know, there are the sequential verification people have looked at a lot then, you know, Microsoft, for example, claims that they have the, the, the huge, uh, uh, they, they improved the reliability in the, in the device drivers because they, you know, called, uh, I think Blast was this tool, they called uh, uh, infinite loops by just using, uh, formal methods and sort of don't allow device drivers that don't need the text. So this is one thing that needs to be done, but this is uh, sequential code. Uh, um, uh, this is sequential verification methods. I mean, just have to uh, look, I, I personally don't have, uh, I mean, I, I teach courses here and I touch this, this, these questions, but I didn't look into these uh, things into detail. But, but this is the first point that, that one needs to have to do. The second thing is then, of course, to link the source code to the distributed aspects. So one thing, for example, is to understand whether, you know, since the verification method deals with specific aspects of a high level code, can, you know, does the code that we have fall into, into, this, into, this, into this fragment? If it does, good. If it does not, you know, perhaps we can derive some, some feedback to you know how we can tweak the code a little bit that it falls into the, into the fragment. And then of course, to have this rewriting of the code into the, into the, into the verification methods. And these are sort of the last three points are uh, points that I'm, I've looked at in the last, uh, in the last year, um, uh, together with, with Cesara, I give you some, some, some idea what, what we are doing there. So here is a, a example. So it's a little bit, uh, drawn to give a little bit of, of overview. 
So what's happening here is it's sort of a, uh, you know, a toy example of a lead election. So you have some local function that tells you whether you are the coordinator or not, an estimate, right? If you're the coordinator, you're going to, to send a message uh, to everyone. And um, then here, this is sort of the code of the followers. The followers uh, wait, for the, wait for messages. So here, if reception looks where you receive messages, and at a certain point, you're going to either timeout or you receive a message, and then you prepare another message, and then you send a message to everyone, and then you wait whether you have received from a majority, and if not, you've received from a majority, and the whole thing is the same leader, then uh, they're going to accept it. So it's just an example of sort of uh, parts of you know what 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 you find in in distributed protocols when you have to you know the old leader creates and you have to find a new one. So what we, our idea is basically to match this, this asynchronous code onto a synchronous system. And the interesting observation is that in this kind of algorithms, you throw away uh, old messages. So for example, this receive here, uh, what it's doing, it's actually checking whether uh, the message that comes in, the ballot number and the label belong to the round the process is right now or whether it's an old message and if it's an old message it's just not it's just not returned so and whether this is the case you can check with an assertion sequentially you check whether the message that you get is the ballot of the me oops the message of the, the ballot message the ballot of the message you get is greater or equal than your current ballot and if the label is greater or equal so if you have this then if this assertion is true and this we can check with, uh, with uh, existing tools, then you throw away old messages. And the interesting thing why this is, is relevant, because this is something which is called communication closure. This intuitively means the following. So if I have here an execution of this algorithm, where in round one, process three here thinks it's the coordinator and sends to everyone, but these messages are super slow. And so process two uh, times out, then, uh, it actually now says, okay, I've timed out, then I, now in round two, I think I'm the leader and it sends the message. And what happens is that this message from one arrives, but it has no effect. It is, um, you know, because of the checks that they have in place, uh, it's not used anymore. So if you have like things, if you have a, a mechanism like this, what you can prove is that an asynchronous system, like a synchronous system like this, uh, is equivalent in a term we can make precise to a synchronous system where basically these messages are not late, but they are lost, okay? So what we can do is we check whether these asynchronous protocols are communication closed. If this is the case, we will write them into a round-based code and then do round-based verification on them. So a lot of the, uh, I don't know if you looked at a at, at, at draft, for example, the uh, there was this paper planning for a change, how to deal, you know, in mechanical proofs and invariants. A lot of these invariants deal with the fact that you have to, you know, deal with asynchrony and old messages. All these you don't have to do if you if you do verification in in in, in rounds. So the 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 thing you're referring to, the planning for change, that's using the the Verdi thing that they built on Cock, right? And yeah. so is that um, that's non-parameterized? Like, did they just pick a some number of processes and they do the proofs for that? No, but it's, it's not. It's not model checking. It's not automated. There's a lot right. of okay. Right. So that's actually a, a, a proof and it is parameterized. Yeah. 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 Okay. I see. But the point is you have to basically, you have to carry big proofs and invariants about the whole message history and, and, and all this. And the nice thing is uh, that if you have these rounds, there are, never old messages that can interfere with you and so you can forget them at strong boundaries. So this is what our idea is. And this is what we would like to, or this is how we started our discussion with, uh, with, with Sharko. Why? I want to show you some, you know, why we believe, uh, why we can do something uh, and, uh, you know, then what is left to do. Okay. So the point is, of course, that and this is from the, from, I, I copied from the Archive paper. For, uh, uh, um, so what you have here, you have these checks where actually uh, 
the height and the round number are local variables, right? So you only are going to react on messages uh, at this point for the current round and for the height. So if a message comes for an old height, you just throw it away. So in this case, you have this property of, of communication closure, which is very nice. Yeah. On the other hand, you have threshold guards, which we can deal with with the method that uh, presented during the talk, but also the verification logic, uh, logic which is our. So this is why we believe, okay, this is, uh, is uh, pretty close. Where it's a little bit different from, from uh, uh, what I've shown you before is that here, the way this is protocol is descript, described here is with this upon statements. So what, you, what I showed you the example before with the, with, the, with, with the loops, right? You had a real, you had a control flow and you would expect messages in a certain order and you only, you know, it's specific location rate for messages while here, sort of these upon statements that you have could, could fire in an, in, an, in an arbitrary form. So the control flow is sort of not visible from the code, from the protocol description. So, but it, it is actually there, right? Because in some sense you, for example here, oh, you cannot see it here, it says step is equal to propose. So in some sense you encode in the step um, variable, you know, the point where you are in the protocol. And I think, you know, and we discussed with Sharko that, you know, these protocols can be, can be rewritten into control flow. So this would be one point that we uh, could do. And the other thing is to, is to extend this theory to this kind of, 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 of protocols. And actually, it's not only interesting for Tendermint. Uh, PBFD, for example, also has a different kind, has a similar kind of, uh, of, of logic. This has a log, but it can fill the log entries in arbitrary order. So it's not like going, you know, log entry by log entry. So, you know, a reduction theorem that would match this kind of semantics would also be interesting part of systems. The other thing, which is a little bit uh, uh, also a pain, is that here this message is actually old, right? You have here VR, which is a, a, a round from the from the past. So you you accept messages from the proposal for the current round, but sort of to prove that this message is valid, you accept messages from the past. And this is not strictly speaking. Uh, um, fitting into the communication uh, closure where we said we have to throw away old messages, right? Because this could, you know, start of being unblocked and then later these old messages come and then this, this, this guard comes blocked. So, so there, I think Sharko has some ideas to address this and to simplify the algorithm that they don't have this. Or the other thing is to, to have, uh, again, a different reduction theorem to this, this kind of communication. And it's actually not so bad because this is not, you know, these messages can be arbitrary all. So there are, um, there are some things uh, uh, we can do. So there's, there, there's, uh, and I don't, and, and for this kind of reduction theorems, I think we have very clear, clear ideas. So it's not so far. Okay. Of course, where it's a little bit uh, 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 tricky is this threshold guard here. Actually, it's not really a threshold guard. It, if, if, uh, if you look at the real system, because this uh, talks about voting power, so which is in some sense a mixture of you know, processes of actually you know, different uh, components in the system and data, which you know, tells you, you know, how, many, how many votes a process has. So making this precise and understanding whether this has influence on the, on the, on the verification methods, um, I think is, uh, we, we should have a look at. And also, in some sense, it has influence on the um, specifications in some sense, because this, this um, you know, the specification is not talking about processes, but about voting power. So they talk about data of the algorithm. So it's a little bit to make it formally precise, uh, uh, it's, you know, be done and, and, and do that. It's different from classic distributed algorithms, that's all I'm saying. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing is that this broadcast here, so we can, uh, when we put classic reliable communication assumptions and, 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 and fairness, or fairness constraints in the sense of every message sent is received and things like this, we can, we can use it for verification. The question is uh, whether the gossip that is implemented, uh, you know, actually implements these assumptions. 
because as, as far as I understand, it's not the case that they actually you receive every message that is sent. In particular, if it's an old message, it must, you know, it just dies out, but you don't care to receive old messages anywhere, but, you know, anyway, but, but formalizing it, um, I think it's, 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 first of all, interesting uh, on, on, on that level, and then also to verify that uh, uh, the protocol satisfies this specification, I think it's another level of, uh, uh, it's, an, it's another verification problem. So yeah, some sort of the, yeah, just to, to wrap up. So what we did is in verification, the features of these with algorithms that are challenging for verification I've, I've uh, um, uh, sketched here. So message passing and fault tolerance, uh, we, we, we can deal very nicely. So where it becomes a little bit complicated is classic partial synchrony assumptions. Um, there we have to, to, to see, um, you know, how to how to to formalize them and, and in particular in particular if you have assumptions like in the in the gossiping uh, I think it's you know since not every, you cannot talk about every message there you have to be precise about what kind of messages you are require, uh, guaranteed to receive and when I didn't didn't touch probabilistic guarantees but also have some recent work to to look into this and then here on the right side the gray are some uh, uh, more um, uh, you know Future, future challenges, I mean future. For example, already if you want to talk about verifying the gossiping, we will have to talk about the communication graph, which is not a click, and how to do with this. Then process IDs, so typically these algorithms, they have a very light use of process IDs, right? At the end, often they just say, am I the leader or not? And it's the only way they are used. Whether you use process IDs more uh, precisely for computing, then you have to think about different, different things. And signature and data structures, yeah. So yeah, but this is uh, yeah. I think I will I will stop there. I talked too long anyway. Sorry. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I've asked a lot of questions, and I have more. So maybe I'll I'll see if anyone else has any questions or clarifications. I mean, this is uh, I think this is quite outside. Uh, the ballpark for most of us in terms of kind of what we're familiar with and, and what we work on. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe folks are like scared to speak up or scared to clarify understanding, but you know, I would, I would, uh, I have heard that you are a, uh, you know, great mentor and educator. And so I would encourage anyone, um, you know, who has questions to, uh, or want something clarified to please, um, to please, uh, take advantage of Joseph's presence. <laughs> Just one comment uh, regarding this uh, slow messages, just to illustrate you how we can, uh, like, um, how we can react more or less on input from the verification analysis. That, uh, uh, for example, these these uh, proof pre-built messages from the past can be uh, piggybacked on top of proposal, because proposal we already send uh, a sort of big message uh, split into time. Uh, and so adding uh, uh, two F plus one pre votes might not be a too big overhead. Mm. Uh, and uh, we get rid of these uh, messages from the past and we are then uh, satisfying the communication closure as uh, right. and then we can more easily verify the stuff. Otherwise, uh, these pre vote messages could in theory uh, go pretty far in the past and this uh, this probably uh, you know blow up the verifier or or something like this. So this is something which is kind of I think pretty sort of simple modification to make. Uh, in terms of you know uh, overhead, uh, it's you know to be seen whether it's more efficient or not. But we are we have possibility to verify the protocol by doing this. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're sending messages from the past in the present. Yeah, but in that case, then this message will not be really treated as a message from the past, but it will part right. a global state right. like a proof, like a polka for the, your your part of your valid uh, value yeah. and valid round, and so it's it's a it's kind of your it's kind of your local state, and then you send this. So it's yeah. not any more uh, message from the past. Right. So, uh, this just so it does not necessarily mean that the changes we need to make are like uh, super you know complex or hard rewriting the tender mint in a control flow uh was not very complex exercise i already did this 
and uh, it's actually uh, surprisingly even more short and even more concise. And uh, also like for the human, I think it has a benefit that it's, the code is more readable because it's start kind of more sequential. You know? At some point in this control flow, you are interesting only in one kind of messages and you just look at this. It's not like that, you know, message can come at any point in time and you need to right. reason what I do with it now. So some of those, right. I think, influence it might have are, are uh, you know, it's not, I think, big hassle for us to adapt, at least for some of them. Uh, and we have an additional benefit that we can then use the verification tools to be even more convenient. Mm -hmm. um, is this implementation uh, like on some branch or something? Like I would like to see it. I mean, I think I have vaguely understood what it means like with this sequential, but I would like to see some code to see if I actually understood it or not. <laughs> yeah, I think I have it somewhere. Uh, uh, I will try to, to find it and, and then share with you. But the control flow is, uh, is essentially like you write the, instead of upon rules, you have a, a control flow, like a while for if, you know, like uh, some kind of C code. And, uh, and then you have waiting condition, which are explicit. You say, okay, now I wait for some, something to happen or timeout to expire. And you block there until this condition is true. And so then the, you, go, you go further. So, so the, the point with the, with the pawn statement is that you don't, no, in principle, they could fire in, in arbitrary order. Mm. And this is not, you know, just not clear. But actually, they cannot because, op like, you have open, you have here this, you always check whether this, you know, the step is the, 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 the current one. So there, there is some order, but it's not, like, really in a sequential, uh, it's not written like this. And, you know? yeah. and if you just think about, um, this is a programming model, if you would not have this, these checks for the step, these pawns could have fire in, 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 in arbitrary order. And then everything becomes a little bit uh, um, uh, complicated. But as I said, also this might be interesting to look at because in BBFD, for example, because they want to do a lot of things in parallel, don't want to wait for a log entry five before they write six. They also do this in, in some sense in, 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 in parallel. So it would just be, you know, but yeah, we need different arguments and different theory. But it's also an interesting, I mean, yeah. Um, sorry, any, does anyone else have any uh, questions? So does this go code, does this go code come without like switch and select statements or uh, like upon does not exist in go? Like for if, if, if this was really No, I don't think, I don't think he wrote it in go. You're talking about uh, rewrote, rewrote the spec. Okay, rewrote the spec. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just uh, <laughs> yeah. a kind of spec, I, but but like more uh, more closer to to C uh, or I don't know. Uh, it's just the, the the control flow. So it's uh, so the uh, spec look much looks much more like uh, uh, C code now. That's that's. I, I thought the code actually looked. No, no, maybe I used I used the wrong word. Sorry. Or maybe I was just distracted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, so Joseph, all this work is really about um, model checking, but can you comment on kind of the, the difference or the benefits of um, like the model checking approach versus the versus using uh, theorem provers and whether or not um, any of this work might translate into simplifying um, like the theorem proving work? I mean, so my understanding of like right now, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, is that um, I guess model checking uh, is kind of nice because it's a little bit more automated. You just like specify a model and you throw it into the checker and it spits something out. And the problem is that the models tend to have so many possible states that the model checkers just, just blow up. And so at that point, you basically have to go and use a theorem prover to try to actually prove something formally. And it takes, you know, many man months of effort. And what you're doing here is basically saying, well, we have a new technique for uh, a new set of techniques or portfolio of them for um, getting some handle on that state space explosion. We, got, we do this reduction, this acceleration, we map the asynchronous thing to a synchronous thing and, and taken all together, now our computers are actually fast enough and have enough RAM to do that, um, which, which, which is pretty amazing. But then I wonder, is there, uh, you know, there, there's probably still gonna be certain limits. And so, you know, it, are there implications of these kinds of results on um, the theorem provers and or on the idea of um, like correct by construction design of protocols. Okay, so 
one thing, uh, so the, in my opinion, the first point is this observation here. So this, because this has nothing to do with, with, with model checking. This is really to understand that the certain classes of distributed uh, um, protocols, and it's actually most of them, which have, you know, round numbers or pellets or something, mm -hmm. they can be proved in a much uh, different way, right? Instead of trying to reason about asynchronous uh, executions, you say, look, you give me an arbitrary complicated asynchronous execution, I'll find you a synchronous execution which has the same effect. So I can just uh, work on the synchronous. So the moment we do checks, we do checks like this, that these protocols are communication closed on the local code, you can either you know, verify what happens within a round uh, with model checking. Uh, and we have uh, uh, a paper in, uh, on this idea in the context of uh, randomized algorithms that also go through an infinite number of rounds. And what we uh, do there is basically we say, okay, they all reduce to, you know, synchronized rounds basically, and, but inside the rounds we use our, our model checking to, to to, to verify what happens inside the round. So this idea, I think, is, uh, is uh, uh, very important. And the moment you have, uh, you, you can, you know, you have this compositional view that I can talk about individual rounds at this point, whether you want to, to, to use uh, model checking or, or, verify, or uh, theory provers, it will make your proofs, it will make your proofs uh, easier. Mm -hmm. so the point for me really, so, the work I've seen on, 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 on theorem provers, my impression is that there is not, they don't use too much insight on, you know, what, the proto what is the important thing about, about the protocols. And carrying, uh, you know, uh, it's, and it's not, um, and then you, you can, you know, Prove everything uh, you, you like, you know, about all kinds of system you can prove with, 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 with mechanical proofs. The problem is you are, with this you're checking a proof, so that you invest a lot of time into writing actually a proof and, uh, and it's uh, very comparable to write mathematical proofs on paper, right? The only thing is that at the end you, 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 can uh, can be checked by by a tool, but you have to, to write the theorems, you have to write the lemmas, and the moment you change little things in the protocol, everything uh, uh, everything can can fall apart. So this is sort of from the term of uh, 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 reusing it. It's 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 really a problem. Okay, that's my that's 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 my view, and um, yeah. Yeah, somehow the other, the... Thing is, the other thing is if you have a if you have a bug in in in, in the system, uh, if you have a what a, a bug, yeah, if there's something in the protocol, it's uh, uh, I mean it's you 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 also you sort of find it by by staring into it, right? You try to write a proof, and when you're not you know manage to write a proof, at some point you will perhaps understand that there is that there is a bug. While sort of with, with if we have an automatic method and, and a good idea how to use it, the tool might uh, will will give you the, the, the counter example. It's sort of the, uh, the main difference. Mm -hmm. So this uh, uh, this uh, async to sync um, mapping, which seems to apply to the vast majority, if not almost all academic consensus protocols um, would make the life of the prover easier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. And essentially, it really dives into the internals of the algorithms and trying right. to understand what is uh, kind of essential and what is not. And you just focus on the essential part and you, you ignore the others. Mm -hmm. And so the, also the additional benefit that the, the, that the, the logic is sequential and, and uh, also humans we as a human are more get used to sequential logic than, right. than like some kind of concurrent one. 
and also uh, apparently computers are, are much better in reasoning about this. So, so it strikes me that actually the only protocol I can think of off the top of my head that, that wouldn't satisfy this communication closed thing is Casper. Um, but are there, are there others like, uh, are there any protocols that are out there that are popular or that have any kind of standing that don't fit into this? I mean, the, this, in the, in the Byzantine case, uh, this, this idea of that you also have entanglement of this sending, this, if you don't use uh, digital signatures, so sending these proofs, uh, right. um, uh, this you find in, uh, uh, in the literature. So whether this, as in, so in this, in, um, here this VR can be arbitrary in the past, there are, there are some protocols, some theoretical yeah. protocols, where they only go back one or two rounds or so. Right. Um, but somehow uh, in the, so in the Byzantine case, there's a point that you can uh, exploit that, right? So you basically you make progress uh, based on a message from a faulty guy. And then later you learn more information actually, ah, oh, there was a message also from a, uh, from a correct guy. Correct. Yeah. While in the Binan case, it seems you are not able to exploit this. And therefore in the Binan case, the just crashes and omission, all protocols are aware of our communication code. But I don't know this customer what it is doing. Yeah, so Casper's Casper's business is fault tolerant, but um, that it's uh, the research effort from the Ethereum Foundation um, okay. to basically build a BFT protocol that's correct by construction. So there's actually there's no rounds, and the state of any node is really just the set of votes that it's received, um, and each vote needs to have a justification, which is basically a pointer to a previous. They're not really sets; they're actually graphs. So um, uh, so each vote has to be justified by pointing to previous, uh, a previous, um, like a graph of previous votes that justify having voted for that thing. Kind of, mm -hmm. so kind of similar to the, you know, this, uh, this is like a, a somewhat simplified version of that kind of justification, what we have here with the, with the pre-votes and the VR. But, um, so Casper kind of just generalizes that and they actually removed the thresholds from the protocol, or at least that's part of their goal is to remove the threshold guards from the protocol and push them onto the client. Um, mm -hmm. which is, which is kind of an interesting development on, in, you know, when you're trying to prove safety and stuff, but, uh, anyways, that, that's a bit of an aside. Um, yeah, I guess because you mentioned correct by constructions. I want, just want to mention we had, uh, one application where actually we compute the threshold cards. So we basically give, uh, hmm. uh the two, the threshold cards as symbols, right? Where this, this numbers two would just be a variable, right? And one would also be a variable. And then, uh, we have a method to automatically generate uh, the, the threshold cards from the, from the specification and the, so the, the skeleton of the, of the code. It's, mm. uh, it's uh, quite nice work out, I like it. But yeah. That's cool, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, any other questions from anyone? We should probably wrap up because we've gone a little late. Um, if not, thank you very much, Joseph. This was super, uh, super interesting, at least for me, hopefully for the rest of the team. Um, yeah, that's great. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll probably post this online shortly. I'm going to stop the recording. Um,